open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. There was a conversation that took place when I was in Bible college. I really, there's a bunch of us guys around when we talked about this. I don't know if your pastor was uh, one of the guys. Maybe he'll remember this if he was. But you know, guys talk about uh, unique sermon texts and, and uh, unique sermons or whatever. And we got looking at uh, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 2 where it says, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And we started joking about wouldn't that be a good street preaching text? The Bible says Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And so we were joking about that. And then uh, some years ago, I'm reading my Bible and I hit Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And I said, you know what? I think there might be something there. So either there's something there or I made it up. But whatever, uh, you're going to have to listen to it tonight. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Four different families in the, in the nation of Israel. Four different tribes, but uh, four different faiths. So our text is Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, Father, it is good to be saved. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, uh, uh, for the, the peace that you give us, for the confidence, not in ourselves, but in you, God, we are not only glad that we are saved, but we are glad that we are still saved. And so, Lord, please, be in this, be in this service and uh, speak the heart of each individual that is here. And God, um, deal in their lives and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. And I'll, I'll just give you a heads up. You may as well put a marker in there because we're going to be coming back to Genesis 29 several times. We're going to leave here, but we'll be coming back here, and so you won't have to look it up or your wife won't have to find it for you again. And in Genesis chapter 29... It's here somewhere. Um, why did I lose my place? Bear with me. Oh, there it is. The name is split. In my Bible, I'm looking for the name Reuben, and it's got R-E-U on one part of it and B-E-N on the other, and I can't find the name. Verse 32, uh, and um, Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben, uh, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, therefore now my husband will love me. And so she has this child. Reuben means son. Now, let me tell you what I, Reuben was the firstborn, was he not? Just say yes. Just pretend you, you know, okay? But uh, Reuben was the firstborn. And what I find in Reuben, because, because like the firstborn is just like the, the, should be the family's natural leader, correct? But he was a poor leader. Uh, he, was, uh, he was not a very good one. Keep your place here, but go to uh, Genesis chapter 37. And in Genesis chapter 37... Here's the story. In Genesis chapter 37, uh, this is where the sons of Jacob are out there, uh, out by um, uh, Dothan. They got the sheep. Uh, and, and here comes Joseph. And so they go, let's kill him. Let's just kill him, and we'll throw him in a pit, and that'll be that. We'll get tired of it. We're, we're done with this streamer. And Reuben doesn't want to kill his brother, so he says this in verse 20. Come now, therefore. Uh, here's what they say. Uh, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, uh, some evil beast hath devoured him, uh, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. All right, that was a good thing to do, was it not? And it says this, uh, 22, and Reuben said unto them, uh, shed no blood, uh, but cast him uh, into, a pit, into that pit, into this pit uh, that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him. Now watch, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him uh, to his father again. 
So the brothers say, when Joseph gets it, here he comes, let's just kill him. And Reuben says, guys, no, we're not going to kill him. Let's just throw him in that pit. That'll teach him a lesson, and we'll leave him there. What his plan is, he's going to come back and get Joseph out of there and take him home. Here's the problem. That's not what he should have done. He is the eldest, is he not? You know what he should have done? He should have said, hey, we're not killing him. We're not doing nothing to him. He's our brother. I don't care if you like him or not. He's our brother. We're going to stand by him. So the Bible tells he did save his life, but, he was, but Reuben was wishy-washy. Uh, he had a good heart, didn't want him dead. But take a look at uh, chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35, look at verse 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilah, his uh, father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Uh, and then it goes on, now the sons of Jacob were 12. So Reuben was, he, he, did, he did a good thing in not letting him kill Joseph, but he didn't take the lead. He did not put his foot down. And I'll tell you something, guys. There are times when you're just going to have to say, this is not happening. All right? You say, well, what if I'm all alone? You're going to be all alone. If Reuben, that was Reuben's problem. He was all alone, and he didn't want to be alone. You know, uh, though this country does not love Christianity anymore. Uh, I think probably it's a little better, or, or at least the uh, attitude toward Christianity is better than it was before the election. But preachers have a tendency. They'll get in some kind of a, a row with some government agency. Then they send letters all over the country and go, you come here and we'll lock arms and stand with the united front. And, hey, guys, if it's right, you take the stand. Whether there's anybody there with you or not. Do you understand? Sometimes you just got to say, this isn't happening. Uh, I was a... Um, after, right after I broke my neck in 1973, we lived in a little, a little village in southern Ohio. My wife and I must have been 500 people, and if there were that many. Uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, I was taking a year off uh, for, the, for the healing, and uh, uh, the volunteer fire department had really fallen in disrepair. The new truck, they had two fire trucks. The new one was a 54 Ford. The old one was a 36 Ford. And, and here was the plan. If there was a fire, take both of them there and push them in it. And so um, they had to, they, they wanted to get, they were going to rejuvenate this volunteer fire department. And, and so uh, I went down there and we went through all these training classes to be a volunteer fire fireman and, uh, and all that. Uh, and, 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 you know, things were going good. And the fire chief had a meeting one night and he said, now guys, uh, we need some new equipment. Like, tell us about it. All the Scott Air Packs were like from 1920 and everything was old. And he said, uh, we need some new equipment. Uh, and we need some money. We need to raise money. So uh, I think that we ought to have a carnival. And, you know, all the money raised, carnival come in and raise money for the, for the volunteer fire department. I, I said, I got no problem with that. Guys, I don't have a problem with a volunteer fire department doing that. I'd have a problem with a church doing that, but not a volunteer fire department. Right. And so he says, we'll raise money uh, through this carnival. And I said, good. And then he started, uh, he started stammering a little bit, stuttering, like he didn't want to say what he was going to say next. And he said, um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know <clears throat> we're going to have this carnival in July. Well, we already voted it through, you know, that we're going to have it. And it's going to be very hot uh, in July. And, and, you know, guys probably going on something cold to drink, you know, when it's hot in July. And, and so um, uh, we, we probably, we ought to sell beer. Now, the reason he was stammering is not because I was there, but there were three Christians, all of us members of the same church. And he thought, oh, man, I'm going to say beer, and it's going to be one, two, three, they're after me. And so then he, so he, so he suggested this, then somebody said, yeah, we'll do it. They, they, they uh, uh, seconded it, and then it was open to discussion. One guy never said a thing. Didn't say a thing. He didn't have any problem with it at all. Uh, another guy stood up, and he said, uh, a good man. I mean, this man was a good man then. He is a good man today. Uh, I can't, he's one of the finest men I know. But he said, guys, I'm not in favor of any kind of beer, but if you guys are going to do that to raise money for the fire department, go ahead. And then I put my hand up. And I didn't get up there, you know, and jump up on a table and go, ah, bless God, it's sin. I didn't do that. I just said this. I said, guys, no one in this room can show me anything good that has ever come from booze. And I said, look, you're going to outvote me, that is fine, but I am standing against it. Now, 
I don't know how to say what their reaction was to that, but you could see my house from the fire department, okay? That's how close I was, maybe a block and a half away. And I think if that night my house had caught fire, they would not have been able to find it. I think they would have been saying, you know where this is? No, I'm, let's hold up the city map in the light of that fire over there. I don't know uh, where this is. Well, I hope it doesn't burn down while we're trying to find where it is. I mean, they were not happy with me. And, and here's our problem, guys. We are afraid to take a stand if we have to take the stand alone. But that is what a stand is, isn't it? And sometime you're going to be at work. And somebody's going to take the name of the Lord in vain. And you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to not do what Reuben did. You're going to have to say, hey, look, I'm sorry, but you can't do that. I mean, there's going to be some place where you're going to take a stand for Christ. And Reuben just couldn't do that. He could not, he could not put it on his brothers. Uh, and then on top of that, he was given to his flesh. This is a terrible thing that he did. This is, a, this is a, 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 a blot on his entire reputation. And so he was given to his flesh. Um, look at uh, chapter 49. And in chapter 49, look at verse 3. This is, this is uh, their father kind of writing his own epitaph to each one of his boys, okay? He is giving you a character summation. He's given his boys a character summation of what he thinks all of them are. And he says this in verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might. You go, yeah, that's me. The beginning of my strength, yeah. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, that's it, that's me. Unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So Reuben, you know how the Bible calls, the, the, the definition of this guy is he is unstable as water. I have met some Christians that are like that. You cannot rely on someone who is unstable as water, okay? And, uh, and take a look now at uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 5. And look at what ultimately happened. Now, if you know your Bible, the firstborn gets two things. He gets the birthright, and he gets the blessing. Is that not true? I mean, it's his by birth, because he's the eldest. And Reuben is the eldest, correct? So he's set up for life. But look at 1 Chronicles chapter 5, and look at verse 1. Now, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, parenthesis, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. The genealogy is not reckoned after the birthright. Now, here's what, here's what Reuben did. And guys, mark this in your own life. Don't volunteer any information. Don't say men here, okay? A good man will do something stupid. A good man, you know, they'll do something stupid. Just stupid. And sometimes you've got to decide... When you look at somebody, you got to decide, is this a good man that did something dumb? Or is this a guy that's always wicked and maybe every now and then he did something good so we thought he was good? Reuben was a pretty good man. But he did something really, really stupid, did he not? But I'm going to tell you where he made his mistake. He never redeemed himself. He never did anything to make this right. Now... I'm going to leave that thought with you because watch what takes place after this with his brethren. Uh, go with me to uh, Genesis, back again, Genesis chapter 29. And Genesis chapter 29. Now look at verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard, uh, heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. The name Simeon means hearing. She said, God heard my prayer. She heard, he heard that I was hated. And so he gave me a son. So I'm going to name this son hearing. Now let me tell you about Simeon. Simeon was not a good man. Simeon was, uh, was a very calculating person. 
keep your place here, but go to uh, chapter 34. In chapter 34, that is, that is the uh, chapter where uh, their sister Dinah is basically abducted and molested. The Shechem and Hamor, uh, there's nothing says she was a willing, uh, a willing participant in this. And I don't even think she was allowed to leave. She was a prisoner, and they're kind of like saying, hey, I got her, so work something out so that my kid can marry her, because we're not giving her back. And you know the story. They said, well, if you guys get circumcised like we are, we'll do it. Uh, so they all got circumcised, and then it says this in, look at verse 14. And they said unto them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that, that is uncircumcised, uh, for, that, uh, for that were reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you that uh, ye will be as we be, uh, and every male of you circumcised. So, look at verse 25. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brother, brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Now, you can believe what you want. The uh, Bible says that, that in one day Solomon offered a thousand offerings. And when you read it and you find out, he didn't offer any of them. It was him doing it. It's kind of like somebody throws a party and you say, boy, somebody really had a party and, and, and they really cooked good and they didn't do the cooking. I think there might have been some, of the, some other people, some of their servants involved in this, that they killed every, but they killed every man in the town. And Simeon was, he is a very calculated person and he is a very vicious person. Now, go to chapter 42. Now you saw in, in Genesis chapter 30, 37, <clears throat> that is where his brethren sold Joseph. Now guys, uh, you know I'm always telling people, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, because I think you ought to read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Um, and I, here's what I recommend you do sometimes when you read your Bible. Get out of your chair. You probably sit in a chair, probably the same chair uh, every time. Uh, when you read your Bible, get out of your chair sometimes. And get out of, get out of the room that you read it in and get out of your house, and get out of the time in which you're living, and enter the scene that you're reading. Because if you will enter the scene that you're reading, you know what will happen? You'll start thinking like somebody in that scene. For example, let's go back to when Joseph was sold. We say he was sold into slavery, but and he was. Nobody knew at that time he was going to go to Egypt. They just knew they are getting rid of their brother, correct? But the Ishmaelites were headed for Egypt. Probably two and two means four, and he's going to get sold down there. So, do this. Be Joseph. Uh, your brother threw you in a pit. You're scared to death. They're talking about killing you. Then they haul you out. And, they, and you go, oh man, they're letting me free. And you go, okay, here he is. And they throw him over to these Ishmaelites. They tie your hands up. They tie you to the back of a camel. And you start being drugged across the, the desert. And you're looking back over your shoulder. And there's your brothers going. And they're counting out their money. Does that sound like a reasonable scene of how it must have been? Because I doubt they let him ride a camel. You know what would go through his head? See, I think this. I think all of the years that Joseph was in Egypt, he had two questions. First off, he's being taken away. His brothers are back there. Can I ask you a question? Do they have to go home? They have to go home someday, right? Um, is Joseph going to be with them? So they have to come up with a story, right? I wonder what they told my dad. I wonder if my dad believed him. I wonder if they killed my dad. I wonder if they killed my brother Ben. Because he was the only one that had the same father and same mother. And if they hated me, I wonder if they hated him. I think he had two questions all the time he was in Egypt. Did they kill my dad? Did they kill my brother? So what would you do? Guess who shows up? All ten of them. Who's not there? His dad and Ben. Now, you, they come in. And I've heard, I've heard guys say this, you know, he said, you're spies. Uh, and I had somebody say one time, well, he was getting even with them because they sold him into slavery. So he was, he was you know, really giving them a hard time and getting even. Uh, guys, I don't know. I think probably one of the greatest types of Christ in the Bible is Joseph, wouldn't you say? So a great type of Christ is vindictive and getting even. Doesn't seem, doesn't seem right. 
See, let me ask you this. If tonight or tomorrow morning, 10 guys walk in, they got suits, they got ties, they got worn out Bibles, they're back slapping, come on dummy, get in here. I mean, 10 guys come walking in here, 10 strangers, and they're all chuckling and having a good time. And you go, who are you? And they go, oh man, we're all brothers. That's just my youngest brother here, my other brother, here's my brother, my brother, brother. If 10 guys walked in and told you they were all brothers, would your first question be, you got another one? No. He said they were spies, but the reason is he needs, look, who didn't show up? My dad and Ben. I wonder if they did kill him. So what do you say? You got another brother? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we got another brother. Oh, really? Where is he? Oh, he's back home with our dad. Oh, your dad's still alive? Well, yeah. How does he know? Because he's sure not going to believe any of them, right? So he says, tell you what, guys. You go back with, I'll, give, I'll sell you some grain this time, but you're going to run out, and you're going to need some more, and I'm the only show in town. You come back here, you don't get any more grain unless you bring that brother, because he believed Ben. But before he sends them out, he picks Simeon out of there. Take a look at uh, chapter 42 and look at verse 23. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not, your, your God, uh, the God of your father, I have given you uh, treasure in your sacks. I had your money, and he brought Simeon out unto them. So why did he pick Simeon? Now, I joke, I joke, I go, I wonder what the childhood relationship was between Simeon and Joseph. <laughs> but no, that'd still be back to being vindictive. Do you know why I think he took Simeon out? Because Simeon is the guy that is going to come up with some way to not tell dad about this and let's find some other way to get grain. When I ran around with these guys, we had this one guy. I mean, you could... You could be caught in front of a burning building with an empty gas can and matches, and he would come up with a story. We loved having his, we called him Mots. And Mots could come up with a story to, to explain anything. It was just, he was great. And so I got a feeling, here's what Joseph's thinking. If I let these guys go about halfway home, you know what Simeon's going to do? Hey, guys, we don't have to bring Ben back. We'll, we'll do something different. Here's what we'll do. And so he, he took Simeon out of that mix so they couldn't, they couldn't do that. Uh, take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 49. And what was Joseph's feelings about his son Simeon? Verse 5, Simeon and Levi, our, breth our brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret. Uh, uh, enter uh, 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 under their assembly, uh, mine honor. Uh, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self will they digged down a well. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, I will scatter them in Israel. So you have those two, those are the two tribes that do not have a chunk of ground. Simeon has two pieces because he's divided in Israel and, and Levi ends up being the priest class and so they don't get it. They're scattered. Do you understand? We say, wait a minute, preacher. It says that Simeon and Levi are both instruments of cruelty and they both get condemned here. How come Levi got chosen to be the priest class? Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son and said, uh, now, now uh, this time will my husband be joined unto me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore uh, was his name called Levi. Levi means join. All right. We know that he was also vicious. We know that he also followed Simeon in this thing of killing these people. Uh, I got a feeling that Levi might have been one of the followers more than a leader. Take a look, uh, or you saw in, in 49, it said he's going to be scattered. Take a look at Exodus chapter 1. Or 
or Exodus chapter 2, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 2. And it says this in verse 1, Now there went a man uh, of the house of Levi and took a, to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw, uh, saw him that he was a goodly child, uh, she hid him three months. Now this is back when they were hiding him because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Uh, and, um, and when she could uh, not uh, longer hide him, she took him in an ark of bulrushes uh, and daubed it with slime and with pitch uh, and put the child therein, uh, and she laid it in the, the uh, flags by the river's brink. All right, that's Moses, correct? So Moses is of the tribe of Levi. Take a look at chapter, Exodus chapter 32, and something takes place in Exodus chapter 32 that I think changed the historical course of the tribe of Levi. Now, next is chapter 20, 32. That is where Moses is up on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights getting the, the Ten Commandments. And you know the story. While he is up there, Aaron builds this golden calf, and all of Israel uh, goes into a pagan worship service. And when Moses comes down, look what it says, verse 26. Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Look at this. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Levi was just as wrong as Simeon. Reuben never did anything that redeemed the wrong he did. Simeon never did anything that redeemed the wrong that he did. But here is Reuben, or I'm sorry, here is Levi, and the entire tribe of Levi gather up and, and back up Moses. Uh, verse 27, he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out, out from uh, gate to gate throughout the uh, camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his, labor, his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. 3,000. These guys stood with the Lord, did they not? They were, I think that is where Levi got redeemed. And I think that is why they stood with Levi, they stood with the Lord. And so when the Lord looked for the priest class, he said, I'll take those guys right there. Well, what about what they did back there? We know what they did back there, but look what they did up here. And they took a stand when no one else took a stand. Look at Numbers chapter 1. And look what it says in verse 47. But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them. For the Lord had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them uh, among the children uh, of Israel. But, they shall, uh, but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over uh, all things that belong to it. Uh, they shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof, uh, and they shall minister unto it. Uh, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. So the Levites ended up being the caretakers uh, of the tabernacle, that being uh, the priest class come out of that. That is Levi. So the, the tribe of Levi did something that redeemed themselves. They redeemed something uh, that was in their past that was shameful. Last time to uh, Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, look at the last verse, verse 35. And she conceived again. Uh, and bear a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Judah means praise. Now, look at 37. Chapter 37. I mentioned, and you already knew it anyway, I mentioned that the brothers, Joseph's brothers, sold him into slavery, correct? Okay, Reuben is prominent because Reuben kept them from killing him, correct? Whose idea was it to sell him? Uh, look at verse 26. Genesis 37, verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, uh, and his brethren were content. 
Wasn't that nice? Uh, he's our brother. Let's treat him right. Let's sell him. We don't want to kill him. We'll just sell him into slavery. But that was, now guys, that was a wicked thing that Judah did, is it not? It's a very wicked thing. So it was his idea. <coughs> not only that, uh, in chapter 38, um, that's the story where he has a daughter-in-law who's a widow, and she ends up having a child by him. And look what it says, verse 25. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose, whose these are, uh, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, uh, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I uh, gave her not to Sheila my son, and he knew her again no more. So in this, in this passage, Judah admits that he is wrong, correct? But <coughs> he does something else. Take a look at chapter 44. Chapter 44. Now, Keep this in mind. Whose idea was it to sell Joseph into slavery? Whose? Judas. Judas. All right. When, when the brothers say to their dad, Pop, we got to go get some more grain, but we got to take Ben with us. And he says, you're not taking Ben with you. He says, Look, you got to. So Reuben stands up, Mr. Unstable as water, and says, if I don't bring him back, kill my son. And Jacob goes, yeah, Reuben's always shooting his mouth off. I ain't taking that. And Judah says, if I don't bring him back, I'll bear the shame the rest of my life. And Jacob says, okay, you can go. Now, mind you, do you remember what happened as soon as Ben showed up? Do you know the first thing Joseph asked him? Your dad's still alive? If Ben's here, he got one question answered. They didn't kill my brother. Is your dad still alive? Yeah. Oh, they came. They, they didn't. They didn't kill. My, they didn't kill my dad. I think a new question came up. I wonder if they want to get rid of him. I'll give him the opportunity. So he hides his cup. You know the story. He hides his cup in the grain bag, uh, and he says, "Now look, whoever stole this this cup, uh, he's going to be the slave of Pharaoh, and you guys can all go free." And they find it in Ben Sack. Because here's what he's wondering: When my brother sold me into slavery, they did it for one of two reasons. Either because they are thoroughly, completely, 100% evil, or they just did a dumb thing. And I got to find out. And so, you know, they get stopped, uh, and they said they're going to search the bags. They said, Whoever's, whoever bag we find that cup in, uh, he's going to be uh, Pharaoh's slave. <coughs> and they find it in Ben's. I think history would be written different if the brothers would go, Whoa, Ben, bad idea. Shouldn't have stole a cup. We'll explain to Dad why you couldn't come home. But no, they said, no, no, we're all going back. Look what it says. They get back. And verse 18. And what, what they said is, he said, I'm going to keep this guy as my slave. And they said, keep us all. And in 17, he says, God forbid uh, that I, that I uh, should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, Oh, my Lord. Hey, guys, you ever say that? You ever begin a prayer like that? Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. Now, he rehearses. He says, you don't understand. This boy right here, he had a brother. My dad, our dad loved that brother, and that brother's dad, he's gone. He's talking about Joseph. And he said, it's going to kill our dad if, if Ben doesn't go home with us. And then watch what he says in verse 33 and 34. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad not be with me? Peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. The guy who said, let's sell him into slavery, just said, I will voluntarily go into slavery if you'll just let my brother go. And in that, Judah redeemed himself. 
Now, please understand, when I say redeemed, you understand that you were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, correct? And so I'm not talking about you redeem yourself eternally, but I told you everybody messes up. And sometimes, you know what you need to do? You need to redeem yourself. So how do you mean? Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, what if you go bankrupt? You have to go bankrupt. You know, uh, you go bankrupt. Now, you know that we don't know this. You may live from the day you go bankrupt. You may live another 25 years. And if we could know your future, we would know that never again in your future will you ever default on a loan, miss a payment, or go bankrupt. But we don't know the future, so nobody knows that, correct? You know, we got this concept in our churches. Uh, it's not that sin is new. Sin is not new. What's new is, it's kind of like this. Yeah, preacher, I killed him, but why do I have to give up my Sunday school class? We, don't, we think it's unreasonable that our wickedness, should there should be any, uh, any, any responsibility for it. And so, guys, uh, you go bankrupt, even though you will never go bankrupt again, you know what you lost? You lost your credibility. And you had better be real good and meticulous to rebuild your credit, because here's what you're not going to do. You are not going to go bankrupt and the next day go down to the bank and get a loan. Because that's what they say. My, loan is, my, my debts are forgiven. That's what bankruptcy is. And we've got this idea, you know, guy goes out and robs a bank, uh, shoots up a, a daycare center, and then says, okay, guys, uh, I'm sorry I did that. Now can I be the Sunday school teacher? No. Well, you didn't forgive me. No, you got to rebuild your credibility. You know, I was on the staff of a church about 2,000 people in Maslin, Ohio. My pastor's name was Bruce Cummins. He was a good man, good man. Folks, he was a tremendous guy. Uh, he was from West Virginia, and he said when he was a boy, uh, when the Great Depression came, his dad, dad was, his dad was a safe man, hardworking man, honest man, but like so many in the Depression, he lost just about everything, and he had to go bankrupt, which meant when you go bankrupt, you know what that means? You are no longer obligated to your debts. You can owe somebody $5 or $5,000. They can't, they can't make you pay. You're exempt. And so he had to go bankrupt, uh, and he got his loans forgiven. And he said, then, of course, we got through the Depression, and, and the economy picked up a little bit. And he said, my dad worked and worked and worked and worked, and I can't remember how many years, but he said he saved up money and saved up money, and then he would go by one of those creditors who he did no longer legally owe money to, but morally he did and paid that debt. And then he went off and paid another one. And he said, before my dad died, he paid every single debt that he had that he was no longer obligated to. Now, when he went bankrupt, the debt was forgiven, correct? But his credibility was gone. And he redeemed himself and reestablished credibility by what he did after that. Do you understand? And what I'm saying, guys, is this. Some of you messed up. Oh, I'm not talking about sin. I don't know. You know, I don't know what you did. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not here to check you out or uh, expose you to anything. All I'm saying is that if you know yourself, you know there's some place you got a stupid thing you did, and you know what you got to do? You go, oh, already asked God to forgive me. Yeah, but now it's time to rebuild your credibility. You're going to have to redeem yourself. Take a look at what happened in, in chapter, uh, chapter 40. 44, verses 33 and 34, Judah redeemed himself. Did he not? Go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 5. First Chronicles chapter 5. Now remember, <clears throat> both the bir birthright and the blessing automatically go to the firstborn. But Reuben never did anything that reestablished his credibility. Reuben never did anything to redeem himself. Now we'll read verse 1 again. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he, it was, uh, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, uh, the son of Israel. 
and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So the birthright that was supposed to go to Reuben went to Joseph, correct? Well, you still got the blessing. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, not, uh, but the birthright was Joseph's. And so Reuben lost the blessing, and Reuben lost the birthright. Joseph got the birthright, and Judah got the blessing. Judah redeemed himself. He did something that had redeemed himself. Uh, take a look with me at uh, Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. Look at verse 8. <clears throat> Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the, uh, in the neck of thine enemy, uh, enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the, uh, from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from, the, from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall uh, uh, the gathering of the people be binding his foal, under the vine and his ass's colt, uh, under the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Judah didn't get condemned. Judah got blessed. And what you see is, of those four brethren, Reuben never redeemed himself. Simeon never redeemed himself. In fact, go to, go to, uh, go to Numbers chapter 25. That thing with Simeon being calculated and cold and, and, uh, and, and wicked, it carried on through his whole family. In Numbers chapter 25, this is when Balaam uh, had told Balak, he said, look, I can't curse these guys because God's blessing them, but I'll tell you how you can mess them up. Send your daughters in there and get their guys all messed up morally. And so that's what they did. And Lewis, it says in uh, Numbers chapter 25, verse 6. Behold, when the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman uh, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Here's what happened. They're not only committing immorality, but guys, you know, at least somebody, if they're going to be wicked, they ought to, the Bible talks about them doing it in the dark. They ought to be a little bit ashamed. They ought not to be doing it out, out in public. This guy, he's bringing this woman to shack up with, and he's looking at Moses. He's walking right past the door of the tabernacle where the children of Israel are crying over this sin, and he's going, hey, guys, look at my date. We're going in that tent. We're going to have us a nice time. He did not even care. Seven, and when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin uh, in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man in, uh, of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were uh, 20 and 4,000. The Lord spake uh, unto Moses, saying, and he, and he blesses, uh, blesses Phinehas. But look what it says in verse 14. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a priest, a prince of the chief house among the Simeonites. Reuben messed up and never got right. He never redeemed himself. I don't even think Reuben was as wicked as Simeon. Simeon was wicked. He never repented. He never redeemed himself. He never... He never uh, established credibility, but Levi did. Levi messed up just as bad as Simeon did back there when they killed those guys, but Levi redeemed himself, and God made them the people that took care of the tabernacle and the priest class come out of it. 
And Judah is the one that said, let's sell our brother into slavery. Yet Judah redeemed himself and ends up being the line of Christ. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you, you might have messed up. Well, that's, that's behind you. You say, well, I've been forgiven. Yep, yep, I'm sure you've been forgiven. But you may have to reestablish credibility. You may have to do something to redeem yourself. I want you to look at chapter 44, Genesis chapter 44, and I just want you to think about something. You know, um, there was a battle, uh, I think it was uh, 17, hmm, I think 1750s, and um, the Indians uh, from ambush attacked a, a British column just east of uh, Fort Pitt, which is, is now Pittsburgh, uh, and they killed every single British officer except one. They tried to kill them all. They killed every one but one. And they even said, aim at him. And they later said, our, the chief said, our bullets would not shoot straight. And that one officer was named George Washington. And I think he had like 17 holes in his coat. That's how close. What I'm saying is, any one of those holes could have hit him and history would be written differently, would it not? Do you know that Reuben had a chance to change history? Look at Genesis chapter 44. We saw these two verses. Look at the last two verses. Here's the Judah talking. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the, lad of, uh, of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father? Those are good words, aren't they? What if Reuben had said them? If Reuben had said that, Reuben would have been redeemed. He'd at least kept the blessing. You understand? And guys, what I'm telling you, look. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for every sin. You do not have to do anything to pay for your sins. I don't even believe you're going to be necessarily punished because of your sins because Jesus Christ took it all. But if you have got something, you may have to reestablish your credibility. Because who's going to trust a guy that goes bankrupt? But you know, you say, oh, yeah, you see that guy right there? One of the most honest men in town. 20 years ago, he went bankrupt. But he went and paid back every single those guy that he owed money to. And you can, give, you can give him a loan on his signature. He doesn't need collateral. We know that's a good man. You understand? You may have to reestablish your credibility you may have to redeem yourself. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Jewish history would be written differently if Reuben had just stepped up to Joseph and said, take me instead of Ben. But even then, Reuben didn't make a move. Judah stepped up. <laughs> and we talk about the lion of the tribe of Judah, not the lion of the tribe of Reuben. Everybody messes up, guys. Everybody messes up. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But it's up to you to reestablish credibility. It is up to you to reestablish your honor. It is up to you to do the right thing. Maybe that's what you need to do. Father.